So we will start now. Namaste to all. Good to see you again. The today lesson will be about the upayas. Upayas meaning the path towards the supreme realization. Sure, like uh, in the classical Hindu tradition, there are three, but actually there are four, because there is one which is outside the usual trees. But you will see it's about uh, grace and the way we receive it and uh, the way we can open more to it to, in this way, access higher modalities to know ourselves and the reality around us. So, like we spoke the last time, in Shaivism it's all about grace, that descend of uh, divine power towards everyone and everything. And uh, for sure, from some point of view, it seems like uh, is the will of God who receives it and who is not receiving it. And uh, in this way, seems a little bit arbitrary. So if Shiva wants, you are full of grace. If he doesn't want, you are out of luck. But sure enough, it's not in this way. They regard Shiva as the sun. The sun always gives his light and worth to everything, but not everything can receive it in an weak, equal capacity. So someone, some of them can use it to grow, some of them just get warm, some of them are just in the shadow and don't receive the light and warmth of the sun. So, in this regard, in uh, Shaivism, this grace is about openness. And uh, this openness is uh, the result of the inner purification. We spoke about those malas, those impurities. So, those impurities are uh, the ones that block this grace to, to manifest fully. So, we have to do like an act of purification to get rid as much as we can of these obstacles that stand in front of this grace. But sure enough, uh, depending of, on our karma and what we did when we last been here, we have more or less of this openness to the divine grace, to this Shiva grace. So, in this regard, uh, in this karma and openness, there are different levels of receiving this grace, this anugraha, this also ca called Shakti Path, the descent of Shakti. And um, is not just about Shaivism, in Yoga Sutras and in other uh, yoga texts, they speak about this difference between disciples and this uh, openness to grace as mild, uh, medium and intense. And last time we, we mentioned uh, that uh, way in which Lakshmanju uh, separated in that Tivra, Madhya and Manda and each of them having other three intensities. But 
in this case of these upayas, of these paths, uh, sure enough, the grace and the openness to grace uh, separate the disciples and the way they can practice. Because uh, you will see, if you are not open enough or not purified enough or you don't have the karma like uh, we usually say, then even if you want to practice some uh, higher level of uh, yoga or meditation, it's difficult to access it or to make the most of it. So for this reason, they recommend that you stick to the practice that it should, suits you. Uh, in the way in which we practice yoga and meditation today is more like everybody can do everything. It's like we go and fill a hole and, uh, I don't know, a yoga hall and do the same practice, all of us. But in the old times, each of the disciples had to practice according to his level. Sure, in uh, what we practice in Hridaya, uh, this separations, separation between uh, different kind of disciples uh, is not uh, obvious, but the way in which they practice the Hridaya meditation is different fun in function of uh, this openness to grace. For, the, for some people, it's all about uh, paying attention to the pause between the breathings and uh, asking themselves, who am I? For others, it's that openness to just being and uh, being present and uh, feeling that energy of the self. For others, it's just uh, pure I and mental void and such and such. So, for sure, there are different ways in which this separation happens, even if it's not uh, obvious. But for the Shaivits, it's more like if you are prepared, then you do this. If you are prepared, then you do this. It's not like everybody does everything. And uh, sure, for this reason, the relationship with, between the disciple and master is personal. It's not like, uh, like more or less we see today in which uh, we all go to the master and stay at the feet of the master and listen to his words and such and such. But you have to go and have this personal relationship so you can be guided to the practice that it's, it's suitable for you, for your level in that moment. This doesn't mean that you are banned to, uh, to do uh, some other practices, but it's better to practice what you can uh, do successfully than try uh, something that is not suitable for you and don't have success in that direction. Uh, and another thing, these uh, different paths are not like closed. So if you are uh, starting, I don't know, at uh, some level, then you have to stick to that level until the end of life. You transform during the practice and you become more open to the grace and more open to the grace to the point that you are uh, at the highest level. And again, for the Shaivits, once you reach a certain level, the practices that are somehow uh, lower level are not needed anymore. But if you regress and you close to the grace, 
then you have to go back to the basics and start again. Because, uh, sure, we have in the West this kind of uh, retirement mentality. So I worked and worked and, and worked uh, some time, then I can retire and live on my pension and uh, use what I get from my work uh, beforehand. But in spiritual practice, uh, the work never ends. So uh, it's not like uh, after some time you reach a level of blissfulness and say, okay, enough meditation, I just enjoy life now and don't think about anything else. If you do this slowly, you get back to your old ways and start uh, again to do what you previously do and the blissfulness gradually dissipates and you wake up in the morning and say, okay, where is my Ananda? Where, where is my blissfulness? Then you have to start again. Sure, usually you don't start from the very beginning because you have experience, you have some scars of the previous practices and they will be activated more uh, faster, faster than, but still you have to practice again to, to reach that blissfulness level that you had before. So this is re the reason that uh, the practice has to go until the end, the end being the moment you leave this body and go in to Shiva. So, there are two ways in which we can look of, on these supayas, from higher to the lower or from lower to the higher. It's always this. Um, so, when I was preparing for the lecture, I was taking them from the lowest to the highest. But then again, thinking about me and how my practice go, I think it's better to go from the higher to the lowest because we will stay more on the lowest where it's more accessible <laughs> and uh, sure we will have uh, something to look after, to look towards, uh, knowing about these higher levels. So the highest of the highest levels and uh, in this regard they uh, separate these levels in uh, in like I said, there are four, but actually there are three plus one. So they are separating this uh, in that one, which is the actual upaya, and the other three, which are more like uh, techniques or practices, because in the first one, which is called anupaya you actually don't have to do much. You already have this openness to the Divine Grace, to the Shiva's Grace, that is like snapping of the fingers. You just go to Shiva in an instant. Um, for this reason, usually it's called, and I think it's better to let you see the the way in which they are called and I think uh, in the writing they are in the way I was firstly wanted to present them from the lowest to the highest so the first uh, thing about this Anupaya is that it's called the wayless the path without path, because uh, again, you don't have to do something in this. It's like a spontaneous way to, to achieve uh, some vid, the Divine Consciousness. For this reason, it's sometimes called Ananda Upaya, the way of bliss. And uh, it's reserved to the 
highest of the highest levels of uh, I don't know if you can call them disciples because they don't <laughs> they usually don't need a master uh, this kind of uh, people they don't need, need a master they just have this spontaneous realization of the divine again this is a, like a level that you can achieve after a long practice or an intense practice we can uh, refer to, to Ramana for example that after a long practice he achieved this level that sim the simple fact that he thinks about Shiva he is Shiva he doesn't have to practice something or to be in the presence of the master or uh, be triggered by something he just is there whenever he wants to be he is there uh, and even <laughs> for this matter in Anupaya even if you don't want to you are there it's like this uh, this way so for some times he for some period of times he can come back to the usual consciousness and interact with people but then spontaneously go back and from the accounts uh, of the Ramana's life he uh, usually was like this he was in the hall with the old disciples and suddenly he was in Samadhi and then he opened again the eyes and interact with someone but again suddenly back to Samadhi without uh, wanting or doing something this path is also known as Pratyabhijna Upaya the way of recognition because again it's a spontaneously recognition of our div divine nat nature we cannot say much about it because uh, you don't do anything and uh, don't have to to be in some way but like i said your previous practice takes you here rarely or uh, is very very uh, hard to think about uh, this so there are very few persons that achieve this kind of level because you again it's very hard to achieve in uh, one life and uh, very few come with this level of uh, openness to grace to uh, demonstrate this uh, thing so for this reason this kind of persons are very 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 rare it's not something that you encounter often sure we want to be like this we aspire to be like this but uh, the simple fact that we aren't is a proof that we are not ready yet it's quite obvious so this is anupaya anupaya uh, now the the word usually it's uh, translated like no way no path an uh, it's a negation of upaya but some some people are trying to to translate it as uh, the littlest the little most upayas because anu ak also means that the smallest of the small so because sure you have to get embodied to have a body and uh, to burn some karma to reach a point in which you can experience this uh, highest grace uh, 
there is like something you have to be there <laughs> you have to be in the body but more than that you don't have to do much so this is about anupaya the highest of the high very rare most of us just dream about it and uh, hopefully if we practice enough and we are good enough and a lot of enoughs we reach that uh, moment in which our openness to grace make us spontaneously without the need of any external aid achieve that highest state the next one uh, from the higher down is called Shambhava Upaya so Shambhu Upaya Shambhu is another name of Shiva he is the merciful one the kind one and uh, sure it's again very high so maybe Anupaya was rarest uh, Shambhava Baya it's very it's a very small difference from Anupaya because uh, in Shambhava Baya you you need a trigger you need someone to or something or usually someone a guru or a master to uh, be like a catalyst some something that uh, puts you on this uh, path towards uh, Shiva but after that impulse of that moment everything goes uh, smoothly and naturally you again in this uh, level you don't have to do much uh, actually this path is called each opaya or each opaya the way of the will so it's enough at this level to want to achieve some experience and that experience manifests itself so it's enough for you to want to be Shiva and you will be Shiva and for this reason it's called Ichopaya the way of will sure uh, like uh, Lakshmanju says uh, in at this level you are capable of achieving samadhi at will so you have that no mind going beyond mind at will and maintaining that voidness uh, that uh, what what in yoga sutras is called uh, nirva <coughs> niroda chitavriti niroda so you don't have this fluctuation of the mind of uh, this circling of the thoughts in your mind so uh, if you want uh, a way to to know that you are at the level of Shambhavopaya is that you can enter sh Samadhi at will you just want it and you are um, and uh, sure it's because I like I said they separate Anupaya from the rest of the Upayas the rest of the Upayas are called ordinary because you have something to do in the case of Shambhava Upaya sure enough you have to be capable of being in Samadhi and willing to or have this intention this uh, power of will to to achieve Shivahood uh, or the divine consciousness and this again it's about this kind of openness because they separate 
sure, you can be in Samadhi and what? You can have no thoughts and what? It's not enough. You understand this? Because uh, for some people they say, okay, I can stop my mind and what? Nothing happens. So the uh, just to have a mental void or having no thoughts is not enough to get to this divine consciousness. You have to, and this is the upaya of Shambhava, you have to want to be uh, the divine consciousness, to be all, to be beyond duality. And this will, this intention, it's the way in Shambhava Upaya. There is a beautiful text, uh, I think I spoke you about it in the first lesson, it's called Shiva Sutras, where each chapter is dedicated to uh, an Upaya. And uh, one of the sutras that are about uh, Shambhava Upaya, uh, it's Udyamo by Ravach. So uh, it's like this enthusiasm, this will, effervescent, uh, intense will. So it's not like uh, I want something, but I w it's like not a wishful thinking, but a very straight and forceful intention and will. This is Bhairava. This force, this power of intention. But sure, it's on Shambhava Upaya, because it, if you are on a lower level and your openness to grace is not enough, your willpower is manifested as just desire. I want to be Shiva, <laughs> but this I want to be Shiva is not at that level of Udyamo by Ravah of enthusiasm and intense aspiration. So you see when we speak about these great masters, even if they are like from Buddhism or other traditions, the great masters usually you can see in them this very powerful intention to achieve uh, the highest level and their whole life is marked by this. So when we think about Ramana that we used as an example, he from that early age of 16 until his end, he had this, I just want to do this and nothing else. Nothing else matters for me. I just want this. And again, if you think about, I don't know, from Buddhist Milarepa, he again stayed in those caves and meditated non-stop because, sure, he was scared about his bad karma and thought, if I don't achieve this in this life, the next one will be bad and I don't, I, I will lose the chance. So he stayed in meditation with that kind of intensity. And all the masters that's, that we hear about it usually have this kind of focused will to achieve that. And for sure this focused will open them to the divine grace and bring them to, to that goal. Sure, I don't want to say that they are uh, from the beginning on the Shambhava level. Most of them start small and just uh, practice and practice and practice, but at some point that intensity, that aspiration bring them or open them to the level of grace that is of this kind. And you, you know about Ramakrishna, they said that he enters Samadhi 
at just the sound of a drum that uh, uh, called the people to to worship. So the smallest thing that remembers him of God takes him to Samadhi. So this is the Shambhava level. And again, it's something to, to aspire to <laughs> because usually we are uh, we are lower and the next level is called Shaktopaya Shaktopaya uh, the way of Shakti or of energy of, or power or uh, in, in other parts it's called Jnana Upaya, the way of knowledge, because it it places a greater a greater emphasis on the awareness of on the power of awareness, and um, sure, it's it's a lower level of grace than Shambhava but it's still a very high level compared to to the basis and i want to i want you to understand the basis for uh for uh, shaiva uh, tradition the basis is that you have an intense aspiration so the basis is not the everyday people that you encounter on the streets then that they think only about uh, how to what to wear or what to eat or who they date or uh, what the work they do that that is not the base level that is like a sub base level so the grace that they speak of the grace that you receive is the one that put you on the path that opens you to the spiritual practice. So that is the base level. You have aspiration. You want to achieve Shivahood or uh, the divine consciousness or something. But so that is the entrance level. It's not that uh, you are not uh, caring about uh, the spiritual things and you are only obsessed with uh, the social and material world or the structures of power or something so uh, even if they consider uh, the lowest level uh, being the lowest level it again implies that you already are a disciple or uh, people that want to achieve uh, spiritual greatness so i don't want you to feel bad that oh i'm not shambhava i'm not shakta uh, i'm just anava just anava means a lot so uh, just anava means a lot and you will see the kind of practices that uh, they uh, they speak about it uh, in the anava case which is the lowest it's still higher than most of the yoga classes that are uh, done in, to, to do, in today's world because most of the yoga classes are focused on appearances and how I look on Instagram or uh, how my peers will see me with my mat going to yoga and I just want to be calm and serene or zen or something uh, the, non-dual consciousness is not my jam i don't want that i want to have a great can ass or something yes can i ask a question sure sure um, so when we talk about shambhava paya are there examples of of masters who have achieved that level who are not renunciates who are householders who have like lives in the world uh, for sure there are but uh, unfortunately we are not very aware of them in today's uh, spiritual medium because uh, the examples that we see today are from the 
the places in which, uh, for example, Ramakrishna wasn't quite a renunciate. He had a wife. I don't know if, if he did, did something with his wife or not, but he had a wife. Uh, Lakshmanju, which was the last uh, great Shaiva masters, master had a wife and I think uh, had the uh, uh, householder wife, uh, ha- householder life. And in general, Shaivism it's not about renunciation. So uh, we give this kind of examples because they are well known for uh, for us. It's much easier to, to speak about those because uh, they are closer to our times. But uh, again, they are not from Shaivism. So Ramana was like his own master. <laughs> He's more towards Anupaya. So he didn't have any interest because he started when he had only, had only 16 and from that point just go forward with his practice. Ramakrishna was more like, uh, yes, we, uh, he had some tantric uh, teachings. Uh, he did some tantric rituals, so maybe, maybe, we don't know for sure what happened in his bedroom. And actually, uh, Ramakrishna was uh, spoken openly against having uh, 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 a life with uh, someone besides you, because he had this kind of examples. Uh, there were some disciples we, who were renunciated and they had some CDs, some extraordinary powers, but then some gods or uh, uh, sages uh, were of, afraid of these kind of powers. So to limit their powers, they give them wives. So in the moment they had wives, the powers uh, dissipated because their sexual energies was dissipated and then so these were the kinds of examples that Ramakrishna uh, gave but sure he gave them not to to uh, speak about uh, sex as something bad but to to speak about that when you take your mind from God then you will lose your spiritual power so uh, if you look at this kind of example in this way, sure enough, it's it's okay. Because even in Shaivism, for example, the sexual practices are only if you are on the level of Shaktopaya, or so kind of high level. Before that, you have to be very careful with where you put your energies. Because it's very easy to go down downhill if you let yourself be taken by passion and sexual desires. And uh, again, the family life is hard because you have to think about uh, children, uh, jobs, uh, having the house. And you have to be very uh, focused and powerful in your intention to keep those in balance and not let yourself taken by by them. Yes. Thank you. Uh, again, if you have questions, just ask them because the, the, the lesson will be more alive with with this and easier to, to understand all the, the things. So going back to, to Shakta, Upaya, Shaktopaya, or Gyanopaya, uh, it uses very much this awareness to be aware of what is happening. Like we did in uh, the practice uh, the, lex- the last time, you saw that uh, this power of being aware of something, because that kind of practice was kind of Shaktopaya, sure, like you saw, for someone worked, for someone the didn't work too much because you have to to have this power of be uh, aware of what is happening inside you, 
and to use that power of awareness to uh, transform what is happening inside you because we were spoken spoken last time about uh, not letting some scars to to take root in your uh, mind so you have to be aware of the energies of those samskaras if you cannot be aware of that how can you do anything or the next step was to be aware that the samskaras have the same nature of consciousness and all is consciousness so it's not quite easy if you are still struggling with your thoughts and uh, your energies and uh, these kind of things and again the practice that we usually do take us step by step closer to this openness to grace and to kind of use this higher level of practices and for this reason they place the sexual ritual in this category of shakta upaya because for sure sexuality is a powerful energy but you have to have a a good grasp on awareness to use that energy towards a spiritual goal and not let yourself just enjoying the the passion and sexual energy and in tantrism this was a problem even in Apinavagupta's time so it's not something that just this neo tantra uh, puts forward in which people are more about how to make love and not how to achieve uh, divine consciousness through making love and uh, that achieving the divine consciousness again is not understood at this kind of level first you can you have to be uh, capable of achieving a higher state of consciousness before you engage in a sexual ritual they think that just practicing sex you will achieve a higher consciousness but it's not like this usually usually practicing sex goes to doing more sex and doing more sex and become obsessed with with sex that usually we see in in this medium of uh, neo tantra and sexual practices and it's not nothing wrong about uh, having good time with your uh, significant other it's not about this but it's about mislabeling things so if you just want to enjoy sexuality enjoy sexuality but not call it a uh, spiritual practice you know because again it's very easily to to get to to the dark side of the tantra in which uh, master abused their, their power to just have uh, sex with the disciples and uh, uh, the disciples abuse this to make sex with other disciples and it's uh, a very very messy thing that starts with a good intention but because they don't have that level that openness to grace that we speak about it it's very easy to go uh, downhill and for this reason uh, like i said even in apinavagupta's time they had to to be very uh, aware and precise about it and they even have their bad examples like we had in our time in which uh, uh, tantric gurus just uh, use this aura of uh, tantric gurus to get closer to the centers of power and then use the sexuality to get more power for themselves and uh, uh, these kind of things that we see in in the world to today that so is not something new even if it seems like this and uh, they have to be very specific and uh, show that if you don't have the level maybe uh, don't do this kind of ritual do your regular love making and enjoy your lover and such but don't go there because 
you are not prepared for that. But sure, this is the juicy, <laughs> the juicy talk about uh, Shaktopaya. The actual thing is that you have to do uh, what is called the purification of Vikalpas. Vikalpas is the kind of mental constructs that you usually have in your mind. And uh, for uh, this, the preferred method of uh, Shaktopaya is Bhavana. For sure, we spoke about Bhavana and we make it seem like an easier thing. <laughs> and uh, just uh, if you have the uh, intention, you can go uh, and achieve uh, different levels. And uh, Bhavana, like I said, in that uh, lesson, it's about the way you can change uh, your mind and the way your mind function through maintaining uh, an awareness of the, uh, the true. So, in this case, the purification of Vikalpa means that you have first to be aware of your ignorance is the first step step yeah you have to be aware that you don't really know who you are and usually you make that error of identifying yourself with something limited and uh, limited and not self it's called usually idam that you identify with that and not with aham, with I. So this is the first step to be aware of that ignorance, which, sure enough, it's also a bhavana. When you identify yourself with uh, uh, someone or something, you actually keep that kind of mental image and act based on that. But they say, sure, if you can maintain that Shivoham, I am actually Shiva, I am actually the Divine Consciousness, then gradually your mind will be purified and that false uh, identification with uh, Idam, with that, will dissipate. But you see, you have to have that power to keep your uh, mental image of uh, Shivoham and it's, it's not enough to just say Shivoham, Shivoham. I, I think I made it clear when we spoke about Bhavana. You have to use that awareness and that inner energy to actually give meaning to this Shivoham. So it's not something, because again, if you just repeat Shivoham, Shivoham, you are in Anavopa, it's like you practice Japa, repeating that kind, because Shivoham is like a mantra, like Soham or uh, other, or Aham, so it's kind of like a mantra. And you can repeat it, but if you just repeat it without having that bhavana, that kind of beyond mind intention, then you are just on anavopaya. So, uh, usually a lot of practices are starting in anavopaya, in that kind of uh, just practicing uh, and repeating that practice, but opening more and more to the grace, it gives those practices more power and you actually ascend to this Shaktopaya level and then uh, with more power you ascend to Shambhavopaya. And they said that uh, usually uh, these kind of practices are linked with Kundalini and the activation and ascent of 
Kundalini, but in Shaiva, Kundalini is more complex than in the other parts because there are various kinds of Kundalini. Some of them start from the heart and not from uh, Muladhara. And uh, I don't know if we will have the time to, to speak about it because uh, the time is like already uh, we spoke more than we have time to. So this is Shaktopaya. Usually Bhavana, mental discipline or this kind of uh, mystical intention or uh, kind of uh, visualization. It's like a visualization, imagination, intention. It's a complex thing in which, again, you have to have a good enough mind, a good enough uh, higher mind, buddhi. Uh, and I don't know if you are aware of this kind of difference between manas and buddhi and the whole ahamkara uh, in inner instrument, but usually mind on the lowest level, it's manas, and function on the level of I like and I want more of what I like, I don't like and I want less of what I don't like. Buddhi, which is called the higher mind, has values. Sure, depending on the quality of the Buddhi and how pure it is, those values can differ. But the difference between Buddhi and Manas is that Buddhi don't pay attention to what I like or what I don't like, but more of what is good or what is uh, good, let's say, what is good and what is bad. It's like a moral compass. Again, that moral compass depends on the quality of the buddhi. Because if your buddhi is, I don't know, uh, right-wing Christian, it has some qualities. If it's a Muslim buddhi, it has other qualities that consider are good or bad. But the difference is that buddhi can go against the pleasure and the displeasure of the mind. So a simple example is that you have to take a medicine. You have a health problem and you have to take a medicine. So the manas, the lower me mind, will say, I don't like this medicine. And if you go by the lower mind, you, I don't know, suffer or die. Because you, you don't like the medicine and you don't take the medicine and you will suffer or die. But the higher mind, the intellect said, yes, it's not good. I don't like the, the taste, but I will uh, survive if I take this. So I know that it's good for me, even if it tastes bad. So you understand the necessity to have a good buddhi, a good higher mind. Because if you just go by the lower mind, you, you will guide yourself with, I, I like this or I don't like this. I like this person or I like this kind and I want more of this. I don't like this practice or this person. And I, if you have that moral compass and this buddhi is actually educated and uh, constructed through study, interacting with spiritual people, satsang and such, to uh, get the good qualities that you need in order to uh, discern between what is real and not real, what is good or not good. Because usually people think, okay, if I have the buddhi, it's enough. But again, if that buddhi had have impurities, what you consider that is good is maybe not so good. Even if uh, it's higher than I like, I don't like, uh, I think you understand. When they speak about this purification of Vikalpa, they actually speak about purification of this higher intellect, of this higher mind. And uh, the practices are meant to 
to uh, do this. And the time flies. We will go now to the Anavopaya. And Anavopaya is like in the name. Anava, if you remember, was that individuality uh, impurity. When we spoke about malas, anava mala was the impurity of uh, individuality. And in this context of uh, upayas means the path of anu, the individual. So is the path of kriya, of action. Again, kriya is the, the higher version of action because Again, there are two versions. Karma, which accumulates merits and uh, demerits and uh, such thing. And Kriya is that action of uh, the spiritual kind in which you uh, want, at least, if even if you don't succeed uh, every time, but you want to act more uh, detached and uh, without creating more uh, karma. And without that sense of I want that kind of result and such. Again, you see it's a higher level of, uh, of uh, the usual uh, yogi or aspirant because uh, you have to have higher uh, aspirations in the way you do things. You don't do for... Uh, I do asanas because, again, I, I want a nice ass or uh, I want a six-pack or I don't know the kind of motivation people these days have or just look good in a photo. Uh, so, coming back, uh, you have to have on this level a good moral compass and no uh and at least try to to live by the yamas and niyamas and uh, they are very important actually and a lot of people are just uh yama shinyama is not but patanjali actually said that uh yama and yamas are the great vratas the great vows is like I uh, I make a pact with God. It's like uh, I make a, make a pact with God that I behave, and in this way I will create that openness to grace. And Patanjali said, even a master is not absolved of respecting yamas and niyamas, because. You again see in this world that some says, oh, I am a tantric master, I can do whatever I want. It's not like this. It's not like this. If you lie, you lie. So you, if you don't respect truths and satya, even if you said that you are a grandmaster, you are not in a truth. If you if you lie, for example. So it's not that if you achieve some level, you can lie. No, you have to, or you can be violent or kill someone because you are a tantric master. It's not, it's not like this. You have to respect those. And sure, at first you respect them because you want to, to create more openness to grace, but then you respect that because they are a way of uh, expressing the divine consciousness. To tell the truth is the way in which you manifest the divine consciousness. And if you remember, Patanjali said that if you uh, abide by this truthfulness, whatever you say becomes truth. So it's like a spiritual power. But you see, it's connected because you are, if you are at that level of openness to grace, you cannot speak a lie. When you open your mouth, that what you say is the truth. 
And you know, like we spoke about Anubhava Nivedana, that hymn of, Apinava, of Apinava Gupta, when you open your mouth, you speak a mantra. It's like a powerful expression of the world. Of the word. It's not like some sounds that exit your mouth and they can be true, they cannot be true. So, getting back to this Anavobaya, again, you start a bit higher than your usual yogi because you already are touched by the grace. Sure, it's not the intense kind of Anupaya or Shambhavopaya or Shaktopaya, but it's still grace and it still touches your heart and gives you the aspiration to practice and have that kind of intensity in your endeavor. And the, the things that are specific to this kind of practice usually are the things that usually yogis do, like pranayama, meditation, uh, japa or uh, mantra yoga, uh, which is uh, a practice that uh, it's very common in uh, all the Hindu and uh, Eastern traditions because is practiced also in Buddhism and Jainism and such. And um, I think, sure, there are a lot of things to say and uh, the practices that are specific to, to Anavopaya are more close to us as uh, the collective level and uh, again uh, when for example uh, Lakshmanju speaks about uh, pranayama he uh, put a great emphasis on that uh, awareness of the breathing and uh, that point between inhalation and ex exhalation that we use in Hridaya meditation but Again, there is that practice that is uh, known of uh, by the name of uchara, of uh, rising the energy or the prana that is used with the prana and with the with a mantra. Uh, they use the mantras, and uh, sure, there are various mantras. Uh, the practice that we will do today, it's, uh, it's a practice that uh, it's on the level of uh, Anavopaya and you uh, will see. And uh, to, to end this uh, with some... Um, some more uh, clearer things. Um, so in the Anavopaya they usually speak about uh, uh, like four or five kinds of practices. So there is this uh, awareness of breathing that is usually called pranayama. There is another practice that is uh, focused on karana. Karana, uh, like uh, antah karana, means uh, an organ or uh, instrument. And uh, this kind of practices focus on the on the difference between what is perceived and the one who is the perceiver. So, uh, us usually using your senses and your 
awareness and perception, you will look at uh, something and make this kind of distinction. This is the object of my awareness. This is the subject of my awareness. Then you start to see that both of them have this uh, common nature and they uh, kind of uh, merge one with another in this consciousness level. And then uh, in the end, using this kind of focusing on uh, this, you uh, achieve what is called Samavesha, which means that you are one with everything in a kind of uh, embracing the world at this uh, inner level. Sure, sounds very, uh, very complex, but it's like a practice that you have to do. What is specific to Anavopaya is that you have to practice a lot, like a lot, uh, different from the other levels of grace or openness to grace. Uh, like we said, in Anupaya there is no practice. In Shambhavopaya there is very little practice, it's just you want it and you do it. In Shaktopaya there is more of a practice, but it uh, has this specificity of intensity, because you use uh, the energy, so you have that kind of intensity and you don't feel it like a practice. It's more like a mystical experience. It's like uh, the ecstasies of dervishes or something like this. You have that intensity and you use your awareness. For this reason, uh, the sexual practices are put in this Shaktopaya because you have that energy and you ride that intensity of the energy towards uh, your spiritual goal. But in Anavopaya, practice. So you have to practice day after day after day a lot. Sure, like in this Karana practice, practice doesn't mean uh, to just sit in meditation and keep your eyes closed and retreat from the world. Practice means that you do your usual things being more aware of who is the one doing them. Uh, the difference, the similarity, the sameness that appears when you see all the things through the lens of consciousness. So it's not, uh, it's not that uh, the practice is uh, bound to the to the mat or to the cushion of the meditation. Uh, because it's another thing that most of the yogis today don't understand is that yoga that you practice is not the, I don't know, one hour or two that you practice asanas or meditation. Yoga is your life. is the way you interact with everything around you bringing awareness, bringing uh, the consciousness and this divine vision in your life, then it makes sense. Because if you have only two hours in which you are more aware or awareish about you and what you do, but then you have like 14 or 16 hours in which your mind is everywhere and focused on frivolous things, what is your practice? Even if you are very focused in, in those two hours, it's very hard to, to balance the other 14 or 16 of... And I don't speak about the sleep part, because there we have much more things to do. So, if you want to, to actual practice, then you have to bring this awareness in your everyday life. So for this reason, uh, the kind of practices that uh, usually are spoken about in Shaivis are very, uh, very uh, easy to bring to everyday life. Like awareness of the pause between breathings. 
you don't have to stay with eyes closed sure in the beginning to just get used to to the feeling and the way in which that pose can give you a little bit of uh, mind rest and uh, uh, break the stories inside your mind but then after you learn that you have to bring it to you everyday life and be more aware or be more present and be more in your life and not let the stories of the mind take uh, control of uh, because if you look on the street you will see most of the people are in their stories and you see those glazed eyes that don't really see what is around them and the story and sure even if they look around them they look through the story lens and try to to adapt everything that they see to that story but that is not awareness is is just living a dream life and not the dream the dream the american dream life but the the kind of uh, uh, the dream that you uh, don't want so this is this is the the anavopaya this is the kind of practice in which your life is yoga your life is practice so you see the kind of openness to grace that you have to have to be the lowest level <laughs> so sure enough uh, the practice that we do today which is called ajapa japa which is like a play of uh, a word play um, which means that is a japa that is not a japa japa usually means repetition and it's a practice that a lot of uh, tradition use even in christianity there is the, this uh, practice of uh, saying pray prayers using a rosary and you say a prayer you get a bead you say a prayer you get a bead in islam you have the repetition of the names of allah and you see that they have those uh, rosaries around their their wrist or just keeping them in the hand and sure it's a it's a practice that they are aware of this uh, necessity to to repeat something and use those uh, kind of malas so it's it's a way in which a lot of spiritual tradition understand that through repetition through uh, using this kind of uh, connection to the spiritual world in our everyday life we can uh, we can open ourselves more to use the context of this lesson open ourselves more to the grace so japa was used and is used in uh, oriental tradition uh, to keep the mind focused on uh, god and spirituality and uh, all the things not letting uh, a lot of thoughts being in your mind and not letting stories to evolve too much uh, helps us being more focused and uh, being more closer closer to to god and spirituality so for this reason it's a practice that again it's almost universal in hindu tradition and uh, in a lot of situation in which uh, they spoke they speak about uh, like an initiation usually initiation in this kind of text means that the disciple receive a mantra and he have to repeat that mantra over and over and over and over again until uh, they purify the mind the buddhi 
uh, is purified and they open to more and more grace and but sure it's about how you repeat it because if you just repeat it like a machine or a robot you don't get very far but again even if you just keep your mind towards uh, something spiritual it's helpful and you get more uh, focus and more uh, awareness from this so ajapa japa it's about being aware it's not about doing like this kind of uh, mantra repetition because it's a mantra that you don't utter it's a spontaneous mantra that is about your breathing and uh, this awareness of breathing which is the spontaneous mantra it's again very famous and uh, used uh, extensively in uh, yoga tradition and in Shaivism. And it's about uh, the mantra, sure, again, it's, it's a mantra but it's not quite a mantra. It's called Soham or Hamsa. Both ways are uh, working. Hamsa usually means the, the male the male uh, swan, swan i don't know if it's a it's a name for the male swan but uh, hamsa means that uh, and so ham means i am he so aham sah aham yeah and hamsa means he am i or like this so it's a uh, wordplay between this I am God, I am He. So it's a mantra that we we uh, unconsciously repeat with each breathing. This is what the traditions say. For example, in Geranda Samhita, in the chapter 5, uh, in sutras 84 to 85 they say like the breathing of each man when it enters makes the sound sah and when it exits make the sound ham these two sounds together compose hamsah that one is me or uh, sorry, Soham, that one is me, or Hamsa, I am he. In uh, one day and one night, there are 21,600 uh, repetitions, approximately 15 for, for, minute, for minute. Each living being, each Jiva, realize in this way this Japa unconsciously but constant. This is called Ajapa Gayatri. And uh, the next sutra, 85, this Ajapa Japa is realized in three places. And those places are Muladhara, the space between the anus and the sexual organ, in the lotus heart, uh, in the lotus of the heart, Anahata, and in Agnya. So this is in Geranda Samhita. Then in uh, Yoga Chudabani Upanishad, which is an Upanishad, uh, again is a quotation in, in which it's like, it's go, it goes like this. Jivatma, or the individual soul, is controlled by prana, which goes up, and by prana, which goes down. Apana, uh, gets uh, prana down and prana gets apana up. The one who knows this understands uh, the interdependence of them who, uh, who gets us to the movement up and down and who understand this, understand yoga. The air goes out with the sound ha 
and enters back with the sound sa. In this way, beings continuously recite this mantra, hamsa, hamsa. People recite this mantra day and night, 31,600 times per day. Uh, this mantra, which is known as Ajapa Gayatri, offers liberation to all yogis. Even if only the thought to this mantra, it's enough to get rid of all sins. There is no practice more holy than this and no wisdom more than this and it will never be. So they speak very highly about this kind of practice. This Ajapa Gayatri, which rises from Kundalini, is the one who sustains the soul, is the, sci is the supreme science of the soul, the one who knows it, knows the Vedas. And again, in another Upanishad, in the Dhyana Bindu, it's it's uh, said that Ajapa Gayatri is the one who offers the liberation to yogis. And uh, also Ramana has a quotation in which he said that this uh, Ajapa, it's about awareness of the self and uh, is the best kind of uh, Ajapa because knowing yourself you will always be aware that you say aham aham or hamsa hamsa so this is the practice that we will do today and it will go like this <laughs> so just a moment that uh, i will uh, say you how we'll do it so there are two ways and some uh, treaties are doing in that way and some in that other way so some them some of them are doing so ham so on inspiration is so on expiration ham others are doing the other way around ham sah ham sah what i uh, why from the experience with the other students I discovered that uh, to each one it's more easier to do it in one way, one way or another. So I invite you to try it both ways, to see what suits you more, more uh, or what, is, what goes more easily for you. Because again, for some, and you see I use inhalation exhalation to to make this because the reason is that that those two sounds hamsa or soham are meeting in the heart so what we want to be aware of is this meeting point in which so meets ham or ham meets sah in the heart because in the heart the mantra is complete. Otherwise, it's only a part. Ham means aham. So it's, a, it's like a prescription of aham. And in uh, uh, I didn't go to the quotation from uh, Shaivis. There is... Uh, it's spoken about in uh, Vigyana Bhairava. There, there is... Uh, presented this practice of uh, Soham or Hamsa is presented in So in the inhale, Ham in the exhale and uh, it's like uh, the, the version that was published in Kashmir uh, Shaivis text and studies uh, are missing the part in which is explained that when you inhale you say so and when you exhale you say sah. But then Kshemaraja quotes this sutra from Vijnana in the commentary to Shiva Sutras. 
uh, on the sutra in which uh, in the Anavaupaya chapter it said that uh, the, what he speaks is a mantra and he quotes this uh, practice of uh, Soham as a practice specific to Anavopaya and to uh, and di- give this quotation in which he says from Vigyana Bhairava uh, is this practice and uh, it makes more sense and every commentator of uh, Vigyana afterwards uh, include this uh, quotation of Kshemaraja even if in the text of uh, Kashmir text and studies is absent. So, is a practice that is present in Shaivism as, and this is the reason that I chose. So, the way in which we practice is very, very simple. And uh, again, it's a practice that we can take from here and uh, make it in our everyday life because it's about awareness of the breathing and the fact that we are Shiva, we are God, we are He, this Soham. And again, uh, this uh, I am he is in the heart. There the so part means the ham part uh, in that small void between inhalation and exhalation. So in that void we just are. And then we separate a ham, an exhalation, sah, shiva, on inhalation and they said that this aha mantra it's actually the trika mantra because trika mantra means shiva shakti and nara or anu the individual and each part of the mantra it's about one of these sah is shiva ha is shakti and that mm, which is a nasalization it's a in, uh, in Sanskrit, it's a letter, it's an M with a dot underneath. And in uh, the Sanskrit uh, alphabet, it's just a dot. So this means uh, Anu, the point, the individuality. So the Aha mantra, uh, it's the Trika mantra because uh, contains all the uh, letters that represent Shiva, Shakti and Anu. So, again, the practice is like this simple. Inhale, so, exhale, hum. But you don't have to, and I think this is the tricky part, you don't have actually to say in your mind, so, hum, but more to be aware of the sound of your breathing that makes that sound. For this reason, I observe that it's easier if you do it a little bit like Ujjayi. I don't know if you are familiar with Ujjayi. It's a pranayama practice that implies to close a little the glottis, I think, in English, I don't know. Glottis, I think it's late Latin. So uh, the throat has these two parts, glottis and epiglottis. Epiglottis are is that flap that close when you uh, swallow something so that what you swallow don't enter in your lungs. So the glottis is the part that is closed by this epiglottis, this flap, and is just the start of the throat and is just above the vocal cords. So by closing a little this uh, very little and actually inhaling and exhaling from the throat trying to to not feel it in your nostrils but in your throat then you will make this kind of very subtle sound when you inhale and exhale Uh, i will try to make it more and i hope it's uh, going through the mic it's like a little like this and i exaggerate i exaggerate very very much so when you actually do it it's someone next to you has to get very close to to hear something but 
exaggerating more is like I don't know maybe zoom uh, had that has this uh, kind of uh, muting or uh, element eliminating the the background noise and this is more like a background noise but i think you get the gist is like uh some someone who is just about to snore is not snoring but is just about to snore so is that kind of friction that you hear but again it's more subtle it's just barely 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 uh you can hear it from inside but someone from outside doesn't hear it so if you make this small noise you will start to discern that in the inhalation there is something like sah and in exhalation there is something like hum so hum yes so hum but it's made by breathing not by uh, your inner voice so this is the difficult part of the technique because at first our mind will try to to go by his usual uh, habits and when you inhale she will say so when you inhale she will say so but then the practice will start to be uh, efficient when you are starting to feel that sah is like bringing god inside your heart hum meaning surrender yourself to the god to god yes it's not like just uh, sounds that you make but is this meeting between shiva and and your soul so when you inhale try to feel that inhalation means bringing god inside your heart exhalation meaning surrender yourself to to shiva to god and that small moment in which you pause in your heart is the moment of pure being so you see that this kind of awareness can be a very powerful practice in your everyday life but first you have to to practice for a while with eyes closed and in a meditation pose so that you can get that feeling that i bring god inside my heart and then i surrender myself to god and in between is that i am god i am shiva in that moment between bringing god inside your heart and surrender yourself to god you are god you are shiva so let's try it and see where it gets us and if you practice the other way around hamsah yes again the same you think sure it doesn't uh, it doesn't go the same because you when you inhale it's actually a hum you is like you uh, express your existence i am and then when you exhale i am one with god i am one with everything so if you do it the other way around so different when where uh, different from the way in which is recommended in uh, vigyana you think about i am i am god i am everything i am all universe so it function a bit but let's try it uh, and see at first just try to see which one it's more easily for you so try to think about uh, how how it's more easy because again i saw that some persons think if i 
think about Ham at ins- inspiration and Sah at expiration, it goes more easily for me. And some people are the other way around. Sah, Ham is more easily. So, so Ham is more easily. So, at first, try both of them and then introduce that, uh, that metaphor, that bhavana. Uh, it's like a bhavana in which when I inhale, I inhale God. When I exhale, I surrender to God. Or if you do it hamsa, when I inhale, I, I express my being, I express my existence and why when i exhale i uh, i embrace everything because it's hum aham i am i am everything it's go it goes like this when you say ham sah is go it goes like this i am everything and when you say so ham god is me or i bring God in my heart, I surrender to God. So, let's close our eyes, getting in that posture that bring balance between firmness and relaxation, that stiram sukham. in which we can stay still with our body, with our mind. Shoulders a little to the back, opening the chest in this kind of open attitude. We center ourselves in the middle of the chest, a little to the right in the spiritual heart from which we will do this practice of Soham, Ajapa Gayatri or Ajapa Japa. At first we will try each of the ways. So at inhalation, Ham at exhalation or Ham at inhalation, Sah at exhalation. We can use Ujjayi to make that sound more perceivable. And we try to be aware of the sound without quite uttering it in our mind. So for sure it's a bit difficult but just try just try to recognize the sound inside of the breathing inside inhalation inside exhalation And now, if you felt that one of the ways are more familiar to you or more easy to do, then use the bhavana. If you do soham, 
So bring the God, the Shiva, inside our heart. Sah, surrender to God or Shiva. And in that small gap between inhalation and exhalation, be aware of the pure existence in which Shiva and you are one in the mantra Soham. If you are doing the other way around, at inhalation Ham and at exhalation Sah, at inhalation I am and feeling that being, at exhalation God, Shiva, and in the middle, I am Shiva, I am God. At inhalation, I am. At exhalation, I am everything. I am divine. Use whatever bhavana you like more and try to get beyond the thoughts or the mind trying to say the mantra to that being mantra
And now slowly we will open our eyes, but trying to, to keep that awareness of our meeting with God, with universe through breathing. I don't know if I, I had told you that, but it's actually very, very interesting fact about breathing that I saw uh, uh, spoken by uh, that astrophysicist from uh, United States, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He, he was speaking about breathing and he was telling this very interesting fact that and I, I think I, I was telling you, I, I had told you that, but I will repeat it because in this context is uh, relevant. He said that every molecule of air, being oxygen or nitrogen or carbon dioxide, dioxide at some point was in the lungs or of any human being that is living in this moment or had lived throughout ages. So in a way we breathe an atom from the lungs of, I don't know, Apinavagupta or Utpaladeva or any other master. So this was a very, very inter interesting image or let's say bhavana that we share. We share through the air that we breathe. We share the same consciousness. We give and receive from every living being, not just human, every living being, every tree or every plant. We are in this marvelous communion and communicating through the breathing. So, in a way, it makes us more uh, responsible of how we live our life, what we give, because, of course, we cannot control what we receive. But, sure enough, in a way, we receive what Apinava Gupta or Ramak Ramana or Ramakrishna had breathed at some point in their lives. So we share the universe with all living beings and it's a very, very powerful image or bhavana to understand and to live by. So if you have any questions, So I made you speechless. <laughs> but it's a good thing and I'm glad of it. So in this way we will end our night here. I want to ask you for some help in a matter. If you reach this point of the video, I want to ask you to write me a few words, not, it's just I am or hello, just to see how many of you are seeing these lessons. Because uh, when we publish, publish them on YouTube or on Hridaya page, we don't have any way to know in YouTube because it's an embedded video on Hridaya page, they cannot uh, or won't measure the views. And I want to see how many of you are, uh, are seeing those videos and actually reaching the end because not just uh, seeing the first part but actually reaching the end. And for these words I thank you 
in advance and for your help in this matter. Thank you, thank you, thank you.